there are times when my pragmatism gets in the way of my theology. And I don't see what God sees. But I'm not ashamed of my pragmatism. It, it has served me well down through the years. In fact, I believe with all of my heart that the reason my faith can stay so sustained is because I'm a pragmatist. I'm not one of those optimistic people who fall apart when things don't work the way you think they should. I'm a person who says, while I do believe God, I allow for struggle and trial. And when it comes, I adjust to it and understand that God is using it to push me forward. But there are others who, every time they run into a, a little bit of turmoil or a difficult situation, they leave church, they leave the Lord, they leave their Christian experience. Whereas I, on the other hand, I expect things to come and challenge my faith. In order for it to grow, it has to be challenged. Amen. He challenged me with Joel chapter 2, although I know it is the Pentecostal mantra. It's what we long for, lean towards, and, and teach and preach without fully realizing the legitimacy of the text. Joel's prophecy is is unique because it gives you uh, one of the three types of judgment that God brings to uh, his people or the world. When God begins to judge any nation, any people, any person, because he's so loving and so magnanimous, he starts with the external. In the case of a, a group of people, a nation, if you will, he starts by holding back the rain. It's called the ecological judgment. He holds back the rain so that the ground will not be fertilized. If it's not fertilized, it will not yield fruit. He does that to get the attention of the inhabitants of that land because it is natural and normal for fruit to come when the ground reproduces. He holds back and gives the people an opportunity to repent. If they continue in their nefarious ways and continue to violate the word of God, he then comes and hits their bodies to again get their attention with the woman. He may cut off her reproduction. She may be barren for a season or uh, he may cause certain things to come on the body in the case of the Philistines when they violated the word of God and violated the instruction of God and took the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the temple of Dagon and, and called themselves conquering God's law and God's presence, which is what the Ark was to represent, he hit them with what the Scripture calls emeralds. And emeralds are shingles. And so he hit them with a severe case of shingles, and they got that thing out of Dodge. They, they just couldn't take it. If you've ever had shingles, they are a pain. They hurt. It is horrible to have them. And the third way that God comes in to judge a, a nation particularly and, and more specifically is that he removes them from their land, is what we'll see in the book of Jeremiah when he says to the people of God that, you know, you've been doing all this self stuff. You've been avoiding my directives and living like you want to live. So he sends Jeremiah to tell them that you're going into bondage. But because God is so loving, it's not bondage that'll last forever. He gives it a definitive time, 70 years. And because his mercies are renewed every day, he says, while you are in bondage, Prepare for restoration. My God, I'm sorry. I'm getting happy about this. And the reason is because whenever God uses something negative, it's a seed to bring you to a positive. The enemy will have you focus on the negative rather than the result. You plant a flower in your garden or seeds. You do so with the hope that it'll become something 
that you want it to become. You don't plant the seed in the dirt and then just not expect it to grow. And so when God began to work in the time of the prophet Joel, the children of Israel had really become incorrigible. I mean, they were literally thumbing their nose at God, telling him what they were going to do, that he just had to take their behavior. Sound familiar? And the Bible says God raised up and sent four types of the developmental stage of the locust. Now, locusts are an interesting critter. They come in, they destroy all vegetation when they're at the full stage, but they, they tend to leave stuff. Like, they might not eat the whole stalk of wheat. They might only eat half of it, and they leave remnants. But God said, nope, because you were so uh, disobedient and rebellious, I'm sending the locust, the caterpillar, the palmer worm. I'm sending all the developmental stages so by the time these locusts are finished, you won't have anything left. There won't even be little, 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 little pieces of it coming out of the ground. You'll be totally devastated. And it was so bad that Joel says the, the drunk people started crying because there were no more grapes. They couldn't make any wine. It was horrible. It really was. Those first uh, few verses there paint such a picture of destruction that it, 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 it boggles the mind to even think that God could move in that realm of destruction after we're hearing so much about his love. But in every case in the Word of God, and you go with me and search it out, but every case in the Word of God, whenever God promises judgment, if you continue to read, He promises restoration. He has never set judgment in the life of His people and not given them a hope. For restoration. It's not going to be this bad always. That's why the Apostle Paul, when he writes it, he said, This light affliction, which is but for a moment, is not worthy to be compared to what's about to come out of me. In fact, Paul suggests that the affliction that we are going through is designed to shine up the glory because God wants to bring the glory out of you. But he can't bring the glory out till he crucifies the flesh. So mm, the amount of the struggle is directly proportionate to the degree of the glory. So you need to stop crying about going through serious tests. That's God's way of telling you there's some serious glory about to come out of you. But he can't. Mm. He can't do it until the vessel, hear me, and I know this is not a, 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 a normal way of saying it, but he can't do, he can't bring the glory out until the, the flesh has been glory proofed. Here's what that means. It means that when the glory comes out, if your flesh is glory proof, it won't, it won't take the glory back. You'll see, you, God will work through you. He'll come out your mouth, and, and when you speak it, he'll move with you. He won't let your words fall to the ground. When you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. And then your flesh, because it has gone through, will just back up and say, give all praise to Jesus. You won't say, it's because I fasted, or because I prayed, or because I studied, or because, no. You'll say, the glory belongs to God. All I am is an empty glass waiting for him to fill me up. See, I'm convinced the reason we're not seeing more miracles in the body is because the instruments that he wants to use keeps taking his glory. And God wants to be glorified. And in my world, he's the only one deserving of glory. My world, my pragmatic, simplistic world says nothing happens without his direction and involvement. 
nobody will even do anything for you unless God is involved. He opens doors for you, the ones he wants you to go through, and the ones he doesn't want you to go through. He closes them to protect you. Oh, you ought to give him a praise just because of who he is, because of who you are. Watch this. Mm. Glory to God. Now, he sets up the nation for the restorative act of his mercy. He sets it up. When we enter into chapter 2 of the book of Joel, in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine inheritance to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Look at that prayer. Look at that prayer and contrast it to the prayers that you've been praying. First of all, they come between the porch and the altar. This is not just some helter-skelter phrase. Between the porch and the altar, God's prophets were slain. Religious people killed the servants of God in the place of worship. And so God says, if your prayer is to have any validity, you have to return back to the place where the offense took place. That's why Jesus said, before you come and ask for God to forgive somebody else, you've got to come and make yourself right. Why? You've got to go back to the place where you messed up. So you can't come up here and sing until you've gone back to the person that you've offended and say, forgive me. You can't preach until you've gone back to the person that you've talked about and say, I'm sorry, I, I was a backbiter, forgive me. You can't just preach over ungodly behavior. You've got to go back to the porch and the altar. And then when you get there, when you've been the recipient of the grace of God, notice your prayer. When you've been the recipient of God's grace, you become a graceful prayer. You don't go to God and ask for cars, women, men, money, and mansions. You go to God and you say what these people say. You say, God, spare your people. Spare your people. Look what he's saying. The ministers are supposed to go and pray for the people. They're not to be waiting for chances to preach. They're supposed to be praying. Listen, when God calls you to ministry, he doesn't call you to preach. He calls you to serve. And the best way to serve is to lay on your face and stand in the... Listen, my God. Oh, hallelujah. Mm, I feel my helper coming. Let me back up and stop this. Because I ain't doing all this hard preaching no more. I, uh, I had a, a teacher. He used to say, don't preach too hard, Lambert. They're going to hell anyway. Give them a little bit of the gospel. I didn't listen. But understand. Oh, my God. My God. My God. Understand. When God calls you. See? See, I have a, a, a problem with God called me to ministry. No. 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 Hear me. I will give you. God called you to ministry, but it's not what you think. God don't call you to the pulpit. No, God calls you to be a gap stander. He is saying, I trust you with the souls of other men and women. So while everybody else is entreating God for stuff, he said, I called you to entreat me for them. And so God will put your enemies on your heart. God will put your friends on your heart, your family on your heart. People that won't pray for themselves, God will put them on your heart. And that's what you're called to be. You are called to be an intercessor. And it takes the anointing to be an intercessor. Because you're going to pray for folk that you don't like. You're going to lay yourself down for people that can't stand you. You're going to ask God to deliver folk that you know deserve what they're going through. That's why Ezekiel, God said, I sought for somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. I looked for somebody, but I couldn't find anybody. And as a result of that, judgment came. Brothers and sisters, you and I that are called, that are tasked with praying for the people, can hold back the judgment of God by us being in our place, on our wall, in our gap, on our bridge, praying. 
You don't need to pray for some car. If you walk up right before God, he'll give you one. You got to come to Wednesday Bible study to hear the, the full extent of this. We pray for stuff that God's already given us. It's already languishing there. That's why you got to get the early morning uh, DCD and understand in the spirit realm, all your stuff exists. Paul said, what I see is already present in, the, in, in eternity. God already gave it to you. You're looking for the manifestation of what's already there. That's why you praise God. You praise him. Until what's invisible becomes visible. Ah, yes, shot. Yes, yes. That woman was bleeding for 11 years, hemorrhaging for 11 years. They probably, uh, I know the Bible said she spent all her money on all the doctors and didn't get any better. The Bible said, but rather she grew worse. But she heard about Jesus. Ask somebody, have you heard? See, all you got to do is hear about Jesus. Just hearing about Jesus builds hope. And hope maketh not a shame. And when she heard about Jesus, she said, look, all I need to do is get to his clothes. I don't need him to touch me. I just need to touch his clothes. She had already seen herself healed. She already saw God touching her. She had already reached into the spirit and brought it into the natural. She said, and when I touch his clothes, I know that I'm going to be healed. And when she touched him, the Bible said the fountain of her blood drew up and closed. My, 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 my. Time for your restoration. 